Well, we are going to be in uh, the book of Proverbs today, as we have been for the last 10 or 11 weeks. And um, you, can, you can turn to Proverbs 18 if you want. We're not going to spend a lot of time in that particular chapter. We're going to kind of be bouncing all through the book, uh, because Proverbs has a lot to say about what we're talking about today. And we've been, we've been in this series for the last, uh, like I said, 10 or 11 weeks, and we've been looking at uh, what Proverbs has to say for our decisions, we've been calling the series Decisions When Life Hits the Fan, because we recognize that uh, the, the Bible has, has wisdom for our lives, and it is written to us to let us know how life was intended to work. And, and, and so, as Matt's mentioned a number of times, it's, it's really, it's a book of probabilities. Uh, if you do this, then this will happen, right? If you do this, then this will probably happen, right? And so, we recognize that this is just good wisdom for our lives. And, and the more we internalize this, the more we take it to heart and let it really kind of root in our hearts, the more it's going to come out when we make decisions. Because a lot of times we can, we can fake things, right? We can act a certain way. Uh, it's not hard to act a certain way for a period of time, right? But we're in the moment and, and a decision comes our way and we have to suddenly respond. What's, what's in our hearts is what's going to drive that response, right? Our decisions show what is in our hearts. And so we've been saying, you know, man, this book really is a book about preparing us to make decisions in life. And today the topic we're going to look at is something that uh, is going to affect every one of us, and it's actually probably the topic that Proverbs deals with more than any other, uh, more, than, more than marriage, more than relationships, more than sex, more than money, any of these things. Today we're going to talk about what Proverbs has to say for our words. The, the, the speech that we use, the, the words we say. And, and man, I tell you what, this is, this is convicting stuff. All week I've just kind of been like, oh, dang. <laughs> I have to tell this because it is convicting for me and I realize how short I fall in, in my words and how careless I can be and reckless and how, how uh, just I can be foolish in the things I say. And so we're going to look at our words Proverbs 18, 21 is where we're going to look today. It's kind of our theme verse for the morning. And it says, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Our words matter. In our conversations, in the emails we write, the texts we send, you know, the comments we post on social media, Man, our words have an impact. And so that's what we're going to invite Proverbs to speak to today for us. And um, we, we realize, we have to realize right up front, I mean, we are a people of words. Uh, studies have shown that uh, people, kind of depending on whether you're male or female, uh, use between 10 to 20,000 words a day. And um, I, I believe it. And, and there's been some studies that show that, that women tend to use probably about double the number of words that men use, and uh, this is true in my marriage, I know, and so, uh, I mean, my, my wife, if, if, uh, if there's a, like a high end of words that you're uh, allowed to use in a particular day, I mean, I think she makes it her goal to hit that mark, right, whereas, whereas I, I, I would be okay if I just like hit about 20, and then I'm good, like I'm content to just kind of let the, the rest of the day go. Uh, but, but, man, I mean, like, like, we know this to be true, right? We know we are people of words. One of the ways, uh, you know, this plays out in is if we have young kids, uh, one, of the, one of the most significant markers for development is when they begin talking and how fast they begin talking. And, you know, once they begin to communicate, this is, this is big stuff. I have, I have four kids, and uh, my youngest, Jack, is uh, eight months old, I think. Eight months old, we'll go with that. And uh, he, he's uh, just started kind of starting to put syllables together and, and just kind of babbling. And all my other kids, their first words were mama. And uh, the other day he was, he was uh, just kind of blabbering, you know, gibberish. But he was kind of looking in my direction. And he, I'm pretty sure he said dada. I'm, I'm just going to claim it. Like his first word, that, I, I own that one, okay? Because all the others, mom got that one. I'll take this one, right? So... He, uh, he is, uh, you know, kind of uh, identified with me on, on his first word. My, my two-year-old, Kate, uh, she is kind of in this fun new phase where she started learning that words are, are this uh, kind of revolutionary way to rebel against uh, what mom and dad have to say. And so she's in this mode where pretty much anything we say, it doesn't matter what it is, uh, she's discovered that no is the right response to that. And usually it's accompanied by turning 
and running the opposite direction, right? And so she's starting to learn that uh, words can have consequences, and, and she doesn't like that very much. And, and so we're, we're kind of in that fun new stage with her. Uh, my, my older son, Hank, is five, and uh, he's a lot like me, actually. He would be content to use very few words in a, in a day if, uh, if, if that's possible. So, you know, he kind of takes after me in that. He's, he's kind of at that age where he, he still says things that uh, he's mispronouncing them, but it's so cute that we don't want him to learn it correctly, and so we actually encourage the mispronunciation. Like, he'll figure it out at some point, right? Middle school, I, you know, someone will teach him the right way to say it. But, like, but there's just these things he says, and I'm just like, I don't want you to change in that yet. Just, just stay little and stay, stay cute. Uh, but he takes after me in that. My six-year-old Heidi, she takes after my wife in the amount of words that she likes to use. And uh, I tell you what, man, some days when, I'm, when it's just me and her hanging out or whatever, uh, it's exhausting. Like, just the non-stop, just like, dad this, dad that, and dad that. I love it. But she, she will max out her word capacity every day as well, too, if we let her. So, so you know, just, just seeing, though, the development, you know, from, from infancy to toddler to elementary school age, our, our kids, they start to learn words, and they start to use how, how to use the words in, in communication. And, and so we place a, a high level of importance on our words. And, and really, I mean, our ability to communicate as humans is one of the things that, that sets us apart as being made in the image of God. If you think about that, there's no one else in creation that communicates in the way we do. None of the animals use words. They don't put thoughts into sentences and, and communicate them. You know? and, and so that's, that's one instance in how we are made in God's image, because God is a God of words as well. He uses words to communicate to us. He's given us a book of words, right, to inform our lives, to teach us how life was designed to work. And, and so God places great value on words. Now, if you look around at culture, though, I mean, you, you acknowledge just the, the importance and the significance that words play, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that I, I believe that right now we are in a, a period where we have an epidemic of reckless words. Man, you just spend any time online um, or, or uh, listening to politicians, right? I mean, we're in the thick of it right now in, in the presidential election. Words are just getting thrown around all the time, carelessly, recklessly. Uh, just a couple stats, even just on, on Facebook, right? Uh, every 60 seconds on Facebook, 293,000 statuses are updated. Every day on Facebook, 10 billion messages are sent. Now, I have no idea if these stats are accurate or not. I found them on the internet. Why well, doubt them, right? Um, but regardless, we know that there's just an immense amount of words being shared, being passed around. I mean, you think of all the articles, uh, the blogs, the, the podcasts. You know, every single thing that gets shared often has words in it, right? And so we, we use words. We abuse words. But words make up so much of our lives, um, and we're all guilty of this, of this uh, reckless word usage. And if you don't believe me, if, if I were to say, I've been secretly recording you for the past 30 days, everything you've said, texted, spoken, uh, written down is on this audio recorder right now. We're going to plug it in and play it for everyone to listen to. You'd probably be a little freaked out. I would be a lot freaked out, right? So we all know that we're guilty of this. We have words that just, they, they slip out, right? Or we, we say something and, and we say we didn't mean it, but, you, you know, deep down we know, like, well, I was thinking that, so that's how it came out, right? Um, but we are, we are addicted to kind of this, this reckless use of words today. And uh, Rudyard Kipling put it well. He said, words are, of course, the most powerful drug used by mankind and so as we, as we look at Proverbs today, as we look at what Scripture has to say about our words, we realize that um, God has a better way. God expects us, God calls us to steward the words that we use, right? Just as we've been talking about in, you know, in the past weeks, God wants us to steward our finances, the money that He's given us, right? We believe that it's His, He owns it, and so we, we are caretakers of it, right? Same thing with, with uh, the, the resource, the time we've been given, the relationships we have, right? We're stewards of these things. It's the same way with our speech. God calls us to steward our words. And sometimes we think we don't, we don't, we don't place as big a deal on what we say. We think, you know, words don't really matter that much because most of the words I speak are just, 
they're not important, right? They're in the mundane parts of my life. Well, I think that the, something we have to realize is, you know, those are probably the more significant parts that we have to give over to God. Uh, Paul Tripp puts it this way. He says, if God doesn't rule your mundane, he doesn't rule you because that's where you live, right? The simple day-to-day speech, that's just where we do life, right? And so if God doesn't rule in that aspect of our lives, he's not going to rule in the big moments, right? The moments where we've planned and carefully articulated what we're going to say. And so God calls us to steward our words. So we're going to start just kind of going through Proverbs. I've got a ton of uh, passages we're going to look at. So if you want to keep up, you can try to keep up, that's great. Uh, We'll also have it on the screens here. But As we look at Proverbs, as we look at what Scripture has to say about our words, the first thing we have to realize is our words have power. Our words have power. Think think back to when you were a kid. I'm sure that most of us in this room could identify a time or two or three when someone said something to you that stuck with you, and, and now you can still look back on it 10, 20, 30 years later. That's powerful, right? Words have the power to stick with us. Whoever said, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt me, probably one of the most worthless things that's ever been said, right? We know that's not true, right? We know that words have power. And, and what Scripture tells us is that words have power that leads to death, as we read in that first passage, or that leads to life. And so what are some ways that words lead to death? Well, I mean, the extreme example of this, right? I mean, we've, we've all heard stories in the news of people who have committed suicide, right? And they, they leave a note and, and they attribute the, you know, just kind of their, their lack of hope or their despair to just words, right? Hurtful words. We've heard those stories, right? Um, you know, that's kind of the extreme example. We, we also realize, you know, the cultures are, are affected and impacted by racism, Right? This is still a huge deal in our, in our society today, um, you know, and, and I'm guilty of this. You know, I feel like, you know, I'm, oh, I'm not, I'm not a racist, but, you know, sometimes there are things that I just don't even think about um, that can come across that way, you know, and regardless of my intentions, those words hold power, right? Uh, you know, the different movements, you know, Black Lives Matter and, you know, different things like that that have kind of cropped up in recent years, I mean, as, as imperfect as they may be, right, there are... There, there, there's an awareness, I think, being raised, which is good, that, hey, our words matter, intentional or unintentional, right? And so we've got to take care because our words can hurt, can kill. And, and so words have power in this way that lead to death. Another way that words can lead to death is through, through grudges, right? If we, we hold on to old hurts and, and we, we bring these up, right, we, we don't work through them and forgive and show grace, but we, we bring them up. Proverbs 17.9 says, Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. Man, many of us have examples of how that has played out in our lives, right? Something's gone down between you and, and a friend or a family member, and um, the, uh, you, you know, you, you, instead of acknowledging it and working through it, you, know, you hold on to it, right? And then you bring it back up when you need to hit them with something, right, when you need to prove a point, right? And, and so we hold on to these grudges, and our words then lead to death in that way. Another way uh, that it's rampant in our culture right now is through gossip. Proverbs 18, 8, the words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. They go down into the inner parts of the body. We all love uh, good gossip, right? As much as we hate to admit it, maybe, you know, just hearing news about what's going on in someone else's life good or bad, right? We, we just, we crave that, right? It goes down like candy. Um, and, and man, that can be hurtful. Again, sometimes even unintentionally, but, but words about other people, you know, a lot of times are rooted in untruths, right? Or lack of, of information. These words can be harmful, can lead to death. And, and then another way that our words lead to death is in our tone, right? Just the way we speak, the, the way we carry our words. Uh, Proverbs 15.1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Man, this is convicting for me, right? You know, sometimes at, at home, I can, I can say the right thing, but the way I say it, is not at all kind, right? Or the way I say it is, is not being considerate of the other person. I think of my, my oldest daughter, uh, Heidi, who's six, and, you know, and she's especially sensitive. I mean, think, guys, dads, your daughters 
are especially sensitive to the tone that you take with your kids, with your daughters in particular. And, you know, I, I think of her, and, and I think there, a few months ago, um, there was, uh, we, had, we had been talking, and, and I had made a comment about, like, hey, we need to go out on a daddy date again sometime soon, and, you know, she lights up, and you know, so for days, she's talking about this, where we're going to go, what we're going to, what we're going to eat, and what we're going to do, and what she's going to wear, I mean, like, she's just, like, like, literally planning the whole thing out, right, and just writing it all out, and just, like, uh, exciting to her, and, and, like, the day before we were going to go out, she was having a rough day, and it was bedtime, and she kept coming out of bed, and I was getting frustrated, losing my cool, and, and you know, and, and at one point, I just kind of let out, like, you lost your daddy date tomorrow, you know, and, and you know, as a, as a consequence. And the instant just crushing, you know, that took place right there, you know, and, and, and you know, ran back to her bed, you know, so, of course, I realized I've just made a huge mistake, right? So I go in and, you know, we make things right. Of course, we go on our daddy date the next day, and, and I'm able to speak words to her of, of life and encouragement and love. And, you know, in that moment, though, what was I, what was I thinking? You know, like, why would I take... Um, why would I use as a consequence withholding time from my daughter, right? It was just careless and reckless, and my tone was not careful, you know? And, and so we've got to be careful about the way that we use our words, the way that we, we carry ourselves when we're interacting with people. Um, I mean, and this plays out all across the board, right? Even if you're not talking with someone in person. I mean, have you ever gotten a text message from someone and you're not sure the tone exactly of the text? Like, this could go a couple different ways. <laughs> are you upset with me or, you know, are we good? Like, and so there's some clarification that needs to happen. But like, can we be clear about our tone as we're speaking with one another, right? Jesus calls us to this because, because like I said, our, our tendency, our, our, our natural inclination is to just be reckless with our words, but he shows us a better way. And, and so just as much as words have power to lead to death and to harm others, the other side of that is, is words can give life. Words lead to life. Uh, in Proverbs 15, 4, uh, kind of continuing the same passage, it says, A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. A gentle tongue is a tree of life. Think about that. The way that we talk, right, the, the words we use, the tone, literally can bring life. Think about a moment when you have, someone has spoken something to you and, and it was almost kind of like you could just feel your insides just filling up a little bit, right? Have you had those moments? I, I can think of a few years ago, I was, I was kind of going through a, I don't want to call it an identity crisis, but I was, I was struggling through some things related to just uh, what, what was going on in my life and my calling and, you know, some different things. And, and I remember calling up my dad on the phone, and, and we were talking, and, and I remember his words of encouragement and affirmation and, and speaking gospel truth into my life, right, and, and just kind of where does my identity come from and where am I placing uh, my trust and my hope. And, and as he was speaking those words to me over the phone, thankfully I was by myself, right, but I mean just tears just coming down. I could, I could literally feel myself just like filling up, you know, where I'd been deflated. It was just like these words were a tree of life, right, bringing life back to me. And, and you know, I look back on that moment, and, and I identify that moment, and there's been others, too, of, of times where the right words have brought us um, up in life. And, and so that is uh, a way that words can lead to life. Sometimes we need to speak where no one is speaking um, in order to bring life to a situation. Proverbs 31 uh, verses 8 and 9 says, Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. You know, one of the things that's driven our, our uh, calling here as a church to help out at Richmond, right, is, is, there is some, there's need, there is, there's poverty there, and, and to our knowledge, no one is stepping in and meeting this need. So we said, well, why not us, Right? Why not us step in and meet this need and, and speak up, you know, and then back it up with action, um, but, but step in for, for the rights of the poor and the needy? I, you know, I think of, uh, you know, one of the, the clearest examples of where we should be doing this as Christians is with uh, just abortion, right? Abortion in our culture has gone, has gone crazy. Millions of babies being killed, right? Helpless needy, right? There's, there's no better definition of someone who is needy and helpless than someone who hasn't even been born yet, right? And so as Christians, right, we're committed to life. We're committed to uh, 
respecting life as God has ordained it, right? And so uh, that's a way that we can, we can speak up, right? Because there's a lot of, of, of speech that is being directed against life in that way, right? And so we can find ways gracefully, truthfully, to speak into these situations on behalf of the unborn. Proverbs 10.21 says, The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of sense. This, you know, this ties in with what uh, Matt was up here talking about. We need community, and part of the reason we need community is because we need people to speak into our lives, right? We need people to speak life to us because we try to go at things on our own, and, you know, and that's, just, that's a depressing path. Um, you know, that's partly why God designs us to do life together as a church, the community aspect of it. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer has a great quote. He says, the Christian needs another Christian who speaks God's word to him. The Christ in his own heart is weaker than the Christ in the word of his brother. His own heart is uncertain. His brother's is sure. The Christian needs another Christian who speaks God's word to him. We got to do this together, right? And, and, and the way that that plays out is getting into a community group, right? Or, or coming faithfully on a Sunday morning, building relationships, getting connected in Bible studies or, or meeting regularly with people um, and, and speaking truth to each other. We need that life-giving input from all of us sitting here in this room, right? We're the body of Christ. We're the church. We need to be speaking words of life to each other. So that's just a little bit of the power of our words, right? They have power to bring death and harm, but on the other end, and this is so much better. They have the power to bring life, you know. And so we want to be a people who uh, our words are, are bringing life. With that said, as, as powerful as words are, uh, they do have limits. And, you know, so it's important to acknowledge, you know, our, our words are limited in their, in their capacity as well. Uh, Proverbs 14, 23 says, In all toil there is profit, but mere talk tends only to poverty. Right? If, we, if we are just about talking and saying good things, but we never back it up with our action, there's really no worth in that. There's, there's no worth in, in us just, you know, knowing uh, what Jesus calls us to and talking about how good it is to follow Jesus, um, but then not, not actually living it out. You know, that's part of the name, that's part of the reason we named this church Outward Church. There, there are a lot of churches, you know, that exist in our world today that, that have a lot of good talk, but, but their lives don't reflect it, right? They, they don't live in a way that impacts the community, the the world around them. And so we want to, we want to kind of pave uh, a different way. We want to be truthful to Scripture and what it says, right? We want to back up uh, our words with action. Another way that our words are limited is they can't alter the facts, right? And, and uh, my kids hate this one too because uh, there, there are times when, when uh, something's gone down, right? Someone's gotten punched or uh, a toy's gotten broken or, you know, something's happened, right? And so dad comes into the situation, all right, tell me what happened, right? And, and my, my two older kids are, my, my two-year-old, this is, this is one good thing about having a toddler is they haven't learned yet how to uh, spin the truth. They just tell you exactly what happened. So that's, that's helpful. But, but my older, they, they've learned, right? So like as soon as the question's asked, you know, what happened? Well, you see, it was, it was him, you know, or it was, you know, it was her. I, I didn't do it on purpose. You know, like there, there's a spin, right, that goes on to the story. And and I think God supernaturally gives us parents the ability to discern sometimes when the spin is happening. But, but they don't change the facts, right? We know what happened. We can see the bruise on your arm, right? Um, and, and so there are times when we'd like our words to change the facts, to alter what is true or what has happened, but they can't do that. They're limited in that. The truth will always come out. Yeah, there's no clearer example right now than the political landscape, right? I don't even have to really say much about that because we all know it's true. The campaign promises, uh, attacks on the other, uh, other politicians, you know, these words are just getting thrown out there with, without, any, uh, without any care to, hey, could this be proven untrue, right? Or does this have truth to it? Is, is it? is it false? Is it hurtful? Uh, I mean, I think the general rule of thumb if you're running for office is say whatever you need to say to get elected and then we'll sort everything out, you know, in the end. But Oftentimes, it comes back to bite politicians too, right? They say something, sounds too good to be true, and we find out that it is too good to be true, right? Um, words can't alter the facts. If you've got a bad policy, it's a bad policy, no matter how much you say to uh, excite people about it. And, and in the same way, 
A lot of times I think we get into this mode of hoping that our words will alter our status before God. And, and we, we realize that this is not true. You know, Jesus warns us against the hypocrisy of that in Luke 12, too, where he says, nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. I mean, we can learn, we can get really good at this. We can be experts at um, praying the right prayers, saying the right things to our, our friends, our community group leaders, our pastors. You know, we can, we can say a lot of good things, but if our lives are not in line with that, we're not fooling anyone. We might fool some people for a while. We're not going to fool God. There's no way. So our words have limits. So we recognize the power of words at the same time the limitation of words, but, but what are the actual, what are the ways in which we can use words rightly, right? What are the, the best ways to use words? And this is where Proverbs really kind of speaks some more to this. So I'm going to go through uh, just a few, a few examples here of the, the types of words that biblically we want to be using, right? And the first, first and foremost is honest words. Proverbs 12, 17 through 19 says, whoever speaks the truth gives honest evidence, but a false witness utters deceit. There's one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Did you catch that? Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Truthful lips come as a result of developing habits of being truthful. Right? We, we don't just suddenly decide to be truthful one day, and you know, in, our, in the moment right, when a situation comes up and we, we're faced with a decision, do I, do I speak truth or do I, do I spin the truth? Do I tell a lie? Right? If, if we've developed habits of truthful speaking, truth is going to come out. Honesty is going to come out. But if we have developed habits of, um, you, you know, kind of altering the truth a bit to fit our needs, then that's likely what's going to come out. Uh, truthful lips endure forever. Proverbs 17:20 says, "A man of crooked heart does not discover good, and one with a dishonest tongue falls into calamity." You know, we so many of us know stories of people who have gotten themselves into a situation, and so they try to lie their way out of the situation, and it never goes well. It, it results in calamity. We can, you know, many of us can point to situations where this has happened. And so Proverbs calls us to speak words that are true, that are honest. The next way that, that we can speak the best words, right, is by using words that are few. And, you know, this is difficult. Even for me, you know, man, a man of few words, this is, this is challenging for me, right? Uh, Proverbs 10, 8 says, the wise of heart will receive commandments, but a babbling fool will come to ruin. Where this is so impactful, I think, for us is um, our ability to receive the gospel, to receive the good news of Jesus in our lives and allow it to get in there and take root, sometimes is dependent on our ability to shut up, right? I mean, if we are constantly talking, if we are constantly saying um, thing after thing after thing, um, and, and in, basically being in this mode of being so caught up with ourselves and the things that are important to us that that's all that we're concerned with, we're never going to be able to receive. We're never going to be able to let the gospel come in and do its work. Uh, Proverbs 10, 19 through 21 says, When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver. The heart of the wicked is of little worth. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of sense. Proverbs 13, 3 says, Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. You know, and these passages basically kind of caution us, right? The more we open our mouth, the more we speak, really what that is is more opportunity to sin <laughs> because it's more opportunity to say words uh, that, are, that are unkind or words that are, that are uh, bringing death instead of life, right? So, so what we want to do is we want to make our words count. Choose our words carefully. Don't just always be spouting words off, right? But think about what you're going to say. Consider the environment. Consider the person. Um, because, because what Proverbs says here, if you catch that in, in, uh, verse, in, in chapter 10, verse 21, it says, uh, the, the tongue of the righteous is choice silver. The heart of the wicked is of little worth. So our words in many ways uh, illustrate or are examples of our worth. 
And, and uh, we have to consider, too, as we, as we choose the words we use carefully, Jesus says that we're going to give an account for every word that we say, right? That, that tape recorder, it's not just for 30 days. It's for a lifetime, right? And so when we, when we go before Jesus one day, we're going to give an account for every word we've said, every careless word, every thoughtful word, but we have to give an account for it. Proverbs 12, 15 says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Man, this is, this is convicting because how many times um, in our lives do we you look at our relationships to so take stock of kind of the, the interactions you have with people, right? Are you the one who's always right in the relationship? Or is, uh, are, you, are you ever listening and receiving and, and responding in that way, right? If you're always the one who knows best, or always the one who has the answer for something, um, it could be an indication that we need to listen more, right? It could be an indication that, man, I'm just, I'm just giving my own way all the time because it's right in my own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. I mean, this, this plays out in many ways. Um, it, it shows up online, especially, right? You look at comments and people are just like, spouting comments, right? Uh, blog po- comments or Facebook or Instagram, you know, wherever your social media choice is. Um, I mean, just without thought, without thinking, and, and people always know best, right? They always, they always uh, have the last word, right? And that's why you see these discussions that just go on and on and on. And, and it's not honoring to God. There's a better way. There's a great quote by uh, John F. Kennedy. He said, Too often we enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. Too often we enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. Sometimes we just have to shut up, right, and think before we speak. Uh, Another way that Proverbs instructs us to use the right words is uh, to be calm in our words. Proverbs 17.27 says, Whoever restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. And, you know, and, and this one, really what's, what's, what's going on here is this is, this is speaking to when, when Jesus is ruling our life, uh, he, he gives us a peace that we can't have otherwise. You know, and, and there, in no way is this discrediting uh, people who struggle with depression or anxiety, you know, or these kinds of things, you know, because there's certainly a physical element to it, right? But the general disposition of the Christian is one of peace, right? It's one of calm. We don't have to be stressed out every time something bad happens, right? Or anytime we're uncertain about something, you know, it doesn't have to rule us. And, and so a cool spirit, he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding, Proverbs 29, 20 says, Do you see a man who is hasty in his words? There's more hope for a fool than for him. This is kind of echoed uh, later on in James uh, chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. It says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. When we look at, at the disposition of our words, right, calm words as a result of the peace that comes from knowing Christ, right? That's, that's in contrast with getting angry, right? It, it, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. When I let myself lose my cool with my wife, with my kids, uh, when, I, when I'm on the phone with somebody and I'm, I'm frustrated about, you know, the service I'm not getting or whatever it may be, right? Am I allowing myself to let the gospel speak to me, keep me calm, or am I giving in to anger, right, and, and going against that righteousness that God desires? Um, you know, and, and sometimes people will talk about, like, well, Jesus got angry. Um, you know, there's, there's righteous anger, which is true, but how many of the times when you have gotten angry, and that's come out in your speech, um, has that really been related to the kingdom of God and the things He cares about? Or how, how many times has your anger been rooted in your own kingdom, right? So, calm words is what Proverbs prescribes for us. And then the, the, the final uh, type of words that we want to look at that Proverbs uh, instruct us in is just appropriate words, just words that fit the situation, that, that are honoring to God. 
Um, because we recognize if Jesus has bought us, he's paid for us, then our words are not our own. They belong to God. It's kind of that idea of stewardship again, right? Uh, Proverbs 10, 31 and 32 says, The mouth of the righteous brings forth wisdom, but the perverse tongue will be cut off. The lips of the righteous know what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked what is perverse. You see contrasting here, perverse talk, which, you know, is not just um, swearing or, or, or things that are, that are uh, perverted in nature, right, which that certainly is included in that, but, but just, a, just a misunderstanding of, of a situation sometimes can be um, uh, considered perverse, right? Um, there's this idea that when the gospel comes in and begins to shape our lives and begins to change us, then we start to have an awareness of what is acceptable in this moment, right? How am I honoring God? How am I pointing to the gospel in this moment? Um, we want to be people who, who are speaking gospel words. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Colossians 4, 6, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. As we, as we invite Jesus to continue to shape us and change our lives, we, we start to develop the habit, right, of, of viewing each circumstance through this perspective of gospel. What has God done in my life? And that brings us to gratitude, right? If, if we're not thankful for what Jesus has done, then we're, we're missing something, right? We're, we're looking through a skewed perspective um, on our lives. Uh, another way that our words need to be appropriate is, is in just the respect that we show for the people around us. Proverbs eleven twelve says, whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding remains silent. Do we feel superior to the people around us? I mean, just kind of inherently, um, because that's going to come out on our words. Are we, do, we, do we look down? Do we belittle? Do we talk condescendingly to people because we think that we're better than them? That, you know, that has no place in our lives as people of the gospel. In Proverbs 22, 11 says, He who loves purity of heart and whose speech is gracious will have the king as his friend. You know, when, we, when we become people who, who are known for speaking graciously, who are known for speaking these words of the gospel, I mean, that's going to get noticed. That's going to be respected by an unbelieving world, right? They're going to see that. There's something different about their speech, about the things they say. They're not always talking about themselves all the time, right? I mean, they, they respect others. They're not saying things that are flippant or hurtful, um, but they are careful and they are gracious. And, and so Scripture obviously has a lot to say about our words. You know, that's kind of where we're going to land today is, is Scripture cares deeply. God, through Scripture, cares deeply about the way that we speak. Um, but we look at the whole of Scripture, right? It's more than just a list of, of good advice, right, or, or practical uh, advice for how we speak. Really, it's, it's, a, it's a big arrow that points to Jesus because He is the Word. Jesus is the incarnate Word of God. In John 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And then, and then later on in John 1, it says, he, he became flesh. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. And, and Jesus did that because he, we, a lot of times we think that our, our problem is out there, right? Like, okay, if, I, if my circumstance was right, or if this person wasn't being such a jerk, right, then I would be able to speak better words, or um, if this person, you know, if, if they would just stop being so stubborn, or if they would listen, whatever it may be, we, we put the problem out there. Well, Jesus came incarnate as the Word made flesh to show us the problem is in here, right? The problem is in our own hearts. Word problems are heart problems. Words are an outpouring of what is going on in our hearts, because, you know, Jesus expresses concern for our speech, not just because he wants us to talk well, right? He expresses concern for how we speak because he cares about our hearts. Matthew 12, 34 says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. The idea there being that our words are indicating what has happened in our heart. 
All right, our words are going to justify us or condemn us because we're either going to claim Jesus as Lord or we're going to give away the fact that we're still living out of our own power. We're still living for ourselves. James 1.26, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless, right? Our words matter. The words we speak are kind of like a CAT scan for what's going on in our heart, right? And, and I mean, we know this to be true. How many times have, have you said something inadvertently and you knew, it just, you knew you shouldn't have said it and you say, oh, I didn't mean that? Deep down, you know, you really did. Otherwise, you wouldn't have said it, right? Like, it, it was there, but you just let it come out, right? And it's kind of like a, a person who's drunk. They, you know, they start saying things that they would not say otherwise, but it's not like they're just getting stuff from the air, right? They're saying stuff that was already there, right? The, the inhibition is gone, and it's revealing what is actually in the heart. And so the key issue here is who is ruling my heart? You know, any talk of words, you know, as we, as we close here, as we conclude uh, this look at, you know, our words, it can't be just about the words we say, right? It has to be about who is the king of my heart. Well, that's the key issue. You know, our, our communication isn't going to change, um, you know, just by, by putting a filter on. Uh, it's, it's not going to change just by cleaning up our speech, you know, getting rid of swear words, whatever it may be. It's, it, that's, that's not going to do anything, Right? The issue is we have to be transformed from the inside out. We have to say, God, I need to be right vertically before I can ever be right horizontally. And, you know, when we're in Christ, God gives us the power to change our words. I mean, how freeing is that, right? We, we, and we think, oh, this is so hard. I've got to learn to speak right all the time. Don't. <laughs> try, yes, but, but, but don't try out of your own power. Try because of what God has done in you, right? Because of the work He is doing in your heart. You know, if you're feeling today like, man, I, I, I hear myself saying things all the time that I regret. I hear myself um, hurting people inadvertently with my words or, you know, even it's on purpose, but, you, you know, you later you realize you shouldn't have done that. And, and you feel like, I just, I don't have that ability. I don't have the, the power to control what comes out of my mouth or, or I just get like, I just have to say this. I just have to fire off this comment, right? Like, that's where Jesus wants us to be, right? Because we recognize our dependence is not on ourselves, but it's in the grace that he gives us through his dying on the cross for our sins, through the resurrection that he offers to us and the new life that we can have in him. Let's pray together. Lord, your words uh, are, are convicting to us and um, humbling to us. At the same time, Lord, the, the word of, of your good news is, is incredibly freeing and it is uh, life-giving. And, and may we come back to these words. May we come back to the, the truth of your gospel rooted in, in what we know to be true of, of your love for us, uh, the, the way that you, you persevere in, in pursuing us. Lord, we, we, just, we acknowledge our weakness before you. We acknowledge that um, we are careless many, many, many times with our, our tone or the, the words we use, um, with our intentions, uh, oftentimes are, are to hurt or are to cut down. Lord, but may you show us that better way. May you show us the, uh, the intent you have for us in our words. May we be people who, who are ruled by you, that we're not living it for just a kingdom of ourselves. Um, that, you know, when we look back on, the, on this recording of our lives, uh, on the words that we've said, uh, Lord, Lord, that we're, we're, not, we're not just centered on ourselves, but Lord, transform us, shape us from the inside out. May that dictate the words we speak. May, may, our, may our heart, may our, uh, our disposition be toward you uh, as we speak words of life and, and as we proclaim your truth and your gospel to our world. So do that work in us today. We, we love you and, and just are thankful for your continued presence in our lives. In your name we pray, amen.